Do, re, mi, fa, so. Hi, and welcome to Festival TV. The only show on Irish TV where no one sings a note, no one needs your vote, and the only judge is your own good taste. And Keen Egan. We have to have him, it's contractual. We keep him in the storeroom. On today's instalment, Tats of the Talk of the Town at Liberty's Inked, we'll be taking a look at Liberty's holy history with Pat Liddy, and Tracy's down at Artist Pub, seeing Patrick Cabinet brought to life. That's all coming up on today's Festival TV. Can someone feed Egan? of this year's festival is the Liberty's Inc. exhibition, which had its launch event at NCAD on Tuesday. Dennis Tyrrell will be telling us more about that in a second, but first we're going to take a look at the exhibition. I remember the first Liberty's Festival back in 1970. I remember the excitement that it caused. There was an outside broadcasting unit down below on where car marker offices are at the time. And I remember the people being involved at the time, the likes of Larry Dillon, Dave Fitzpatrick, Gannon Callahan, Michael Chemis Walsh, uh, there's other people there, oh, Larkin O'Dellun, Larry Dillon's cousin, <coughs> Anna Callahan, other people who were greatly involved and greatly, and loved the Liberties an awful lot, and they were really determined to show the Liberties for what it was, as a great place of culture, heritage, and a community spirit, a vibrant community spirit that was there at the time. It's going on now, it's... Uh, in its 44th year, which is an amazing achievement for any festival, and I'm really proud to be around at this time, uh, things like, you know? So, the exhibition tonight, I've worked in the Liberties four years, I like tattoos as well, um, but one of the things you notice about people in the Liberties, nearly everyone has a tattoo, you're actually, if you don't have a tattoo, it's quite unusual. So we'd been talking about the idea of what could we do with that. And as a trial, um, three weeks ago, we had one day called Tattoo You, and we invited people to book themselves in for a portrait. And well, you've seen the results tonight. We've been blown away by the photography, by the people that give up their time to get their photographs taken, and by the artwork on their body. Uh, my name is Gerard O'Donnell. I uh, photographed the exhibition tonight for the Liberties Festival. I would never have considered myself a professional photographer, even though I'm, I've taken photos from the age of 17. I, had, I got my first camera when I was like a kid, really. And I've begun to understand how important lighting was and how, you know, a photograph can create a mood. Um, I wasn't intending on doing this, and I never ever thought that I would have a photography exhibition, but I am quite proud of it. I'm quite proud of it. I like the result. If I walked in, I, I think I would like this, you know. The thing that excites me the most about creating this was I don't have any tattoos and I never understood why someone would have a tattoo and live with that for the rest of their lives. But now I understand why someone would have a tattoo on their arm and because it reminds them of a loved one that has passed away or a moment in their life that has been so special to them. Well, my tattoo started off as one little Chinese symbol. Um, I got it done on my 30th birthday. I thought, okay, I've wanted a tattoo for years. If I get one when I'm 30, I kind of want one. And it's grown from then. Um, so it's developed over the years and it's gotten bigger. And I'm always planning my next one. My next tattoo is always in my head. So uh, this arm is kind of finished for the minute. So I'm moving over to the next arm now. And now we're going to be talking to Dennis Tyrrell, whose tattoo was featured in the exhibition. Fair. How are you doing, Dennis? I'm doing well, Melissa, and you. Grand. Nice to see you. So your tattoo was featured. Um, a lot of tattoos, they have stories behind them. What's the story behind yours? Yeah, I got the tattoo in 1969, and um, Johnny Eagles. And um, when I got it, uh, I was 15, and, you know, what 15 year olds do at the time, you know, so I didn't expect any hassle over it or anything like that. And uh, I lived with an aunt and uncle. And I came home that night, at about, I went dancing or something, and I came home that night, and my uncle came in and he a few jars on him. And uh, me being who I was and all that, you know, I was showing off and I said, uh, What do you think of my tattoo? And uh, 
he said to me, what does that signify? So, as a 15-year-old, I didn't even know what signify meant. Signify meant. So, uh, I said, I just got a tattoo, you know. And, uh, and he, there was more around the house, and he just told me to get out. <laughs> and that was, that's what happened that particular night, you know. And um, it's a thing that, it, it, it was so, when I look back at it on the years later, you know, when you see people getting tattoos now, uh, they just go and get them. Yeah. Don't have to ask permission. And uh, and it was around, but it was out of the house for a while, you know, that uh, I was afraid to go back, you know. So um, that's, the, that's the story of that tattoo. And what made you want to be part of the exhibition? I was asked by the, I, the I'm the postman in the area, and I was asked by them over in number 90, May 3, you know, I, I had a short sleeve short on one day and they said it to me, would I be interested? And, uh, and being a Liberty boy, I said, sure, why not, you know, help out in any way I can. And I was always, I knew Mary Mooney, I know she used to run the Liberty Festival going back many, many years ago, you know, and it'd be nice to be part of it, you know. And I'm having great fun talking to my kids about it, you know, because I'm telling them I'm only a part-time postman now, I'm going to be a star. <laughs> because I was on the gathering, you know. <laughs> and do your kids have tattoos or anything like that? My daughter and my son, one of my sons has, yeah. My, yeah. my daughter has four. Uh, she's two skulls on the back of her calf. And uh, she's one on the top of her backside and she's another one somewhere else. I don't know where it is. <laughs> and my youngest has a tattoo on his, uh, on his just right there in his chest. And... Uh, no, I don't know. They just decided to get them, and uh, I didn't tell them out of <laughs> <laughs> You know, so I suppose I couldn't. You know, but that that they have them, yeah, yeah, yeah and they cool. like them. And but as I said, it's it's great fun, and uh, you know, it's good to to do something. You know, yeah. and uh, to do something like this, I know it takes an awful lot of effort, and uh, you people need uh, as much help as possible. So I don't have any problem giving giving me time. Uh, thanks for coming today, that was brilliant. That's no problem at all, and <laughs> no. uh, thank you for having me. No okay. Uh, now we're going to be going down to the crypts of Christ Church and seeing what kind of unburied treasures we can find. This is the wonderful old crypt of Christ Church Cathedral. This crypt, you know, is actually the oldest structure in the centre of Dublin. And it dates from the origins of the stone Christ Church Cathedral. The old cathedral founded by the Vikings dates from 1030, and that was a wooden building. Whereas the stone building dates from the time of the Normans, built in the 1170s. And that's when this crypt was erected. One of the biggest cathedral crypts uh, in these islands. In an early medieval city where houses were built mainly of wattle and daub or at best wood, uh, the crypt here in Christ Church was a terrific dry building where people could do business, have meetings, sell goods, store whiskey. And this crypt was used for all sorts of commercial reasons while up above the business of God was done. Uh, it was a bit like Christ throwing the traders out of the temple in Jerusalem. Eventually the church got a bit fed up with traders down here in the crypt and uh, they're long gone. Here we have the father and son statues, a royal couple. During the restoration of Christ Church Cathedral in the 1870s, many statues and memorials ended up here in the crypt. And two of those incidental treasures, if you like, uh, were statues that came from above the Tulsal, or the old city hall that was demolished in the 18th century that stood just outside the cathedral. On my left is Charles I of England, who lost his head to Oliver Cromwell. And on my right, we have the, the rather weather-beaten face of his son, Charles II. Christ Church Liberty also administratively took in a church called St. Mickens on the north side of Dublin, where tourists today can go and visit the 600 human mummies and see how they're preserved by the atmosphere. 
But here in the crypt of Christ Church, we have two very famous mummies, but they're not human. One is a cat, one is a rat. And it appears that the rat was being chased by the dutiful cat. The rat was a clever Dublin rat, and it jumped in to an organ pipe, thinking it would escape. The cat jumped in after the rat, and the cat duly got stuck. And both of them couldn't get out, and they remained there for many, many years. And the air rushing through the organ pipe ultimately mummified the two animals. O stony grey streets of the liberties, though your name conjures passion sublime, it makes me all trembly and jittery, because it has no obvious rhyme. To see a disciple of Kavanaugh, we send Tracy to meet PJ Brady. So here he is backstage having a chat with that stylish young lady. We're here off Thomas Street in the heart of the Irish historic brewing industry, where we're about to discover a really amazing, inspiring Irish poet. Hi PJ, um, I'm oh, delighted thanks. and very excited to be interviewing you here today. Um, what actually inspired you to write this um, play about the life of Patrick Kavanagh? The first thing is I started to rehearse my life as an actor in performance in the Gate Theatre in 1986. And I was in a production of uh, Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw. And at the time I was working with the actor Eamon Morrissey. Uh, who is a very well-known Irish actor, household name. So Eamon said to me, you must read uh, The Green Fool. So I said, OK. Next day I got the book, and I looked at it, and the moment I opened the book, I, I hadn't even to open it, I just looked at the cover, and I realised here was a person's life that I could relate to. My father played the melodeon outside of our gates. There were stars in the morning east, and they danced to his music. PJ, I'm just wondering, because we are at the Liberties Arts Festival today, is there a reason why you were compelled to bring your one-man show to the Liberties Art Festival? Did Patrick Kavanagh live here, or did he have some sort of affiliation here? Well, I think if we look at one word in his poems, Rialto, and right. Rialto is not very far out of the Liberties, you know? There's a place and a space that Patrick Kavanagh calls Rialto, the Rialto Bridge, you know? So he has created the liberties in his poems as well. So yes, did he live here at any time? I couldn't be 100% sure, but I'm sure he visited many a time. But he didn't like my daydreaming way of coming. He used to say, you'll end your days in the workhouse if you don't pick your gate of going. PJ, if Patrick Kavner was alive today and his poetry wanted to reflect one um, core statement that he thought about life and maybe his spiritual footprint or legacy that was left from his poetry. What would you say that was? Uh, overall, I guess his message was uh, to live and let live. Yeah. You know, non-judgmental. Uh, everyone's process is their own. Everyone has a value in themselves. And he said that he had the gift of making men feel as small as they really were. That's really lovely. Thank you so much, um, PJ. I'm absolutely intrigued to see this play now and um, wishing you the best of luck with your performance tonight. Thank you. Thanks Thank a you million, PJ. Tracy. Thank you. Oh, you are not lying in the wet clay, for it is harvest evening now, and we are piling up the reeks against the moonlight, and you look up at us eternally. If you've got a thirst for literature, you should pop down to Baker's Bar on Friday, where Sean O'Connor will be reading an extract from his memoirs of a Liberty's childhood. That's 1.30pm, Baker's Bar on Friday. We'll also be back on Friday with the biggest show to hit the Liberty since the monks of John's Lane got caught up in a gale. That's 8 o'clock on Friday, DCTV, and you can also catch us online. See you then.